I felt I needed the help because I'd been unable to stop on my own. So any help coming my way was was okay. Yeah. Kuna marafiki zangu wa waliaga juu ya madawa. Wengine wakajiuzisha na kuenda kujiuza prostitution. So najua hiyo dawa ni lazima uko na pesa na ni pesa ya haraka haraka. Sasa wengine wakakuwa wanaenda wanaenda hiyo prostitution kuziuza, wengine wakagonjeka, wakashikwa na ukimwi. Lakini sasa mimi kwa bahati poa sikushikwa na ukimwi, juu mimi sikuenda prostitution, sikutumia mambo kama hiyo ati kujiuza ndio nipate pesa ya dawa. Mimi sasa nilikuwa mimi nilikuwa afadhali nienda nikaibe. Mara mingi nilikuwa naenda shoplifting, nenda kwa supermarket. Naiba vitu napelekea watu nauza, alafu napata pesa ya kuvuta. Eh sasa hapo hata ndio nilibahatikia. Wengine wali walikufa hata kupigwa na mob. Pia wizi zingine kubwa kubwa za, za vitu za watu, unaona wengine wanapigwa, wengine wanafungwa. Lakini sasa hizi mambo poa mimi sikubahatikana mambo kama hizo. A wake up call came for John. It was being unable to progress anywhere in life after expulsion from university. For Anne, it was seeing her friends go down with heroin. Anne's rehabilitation was different. She joined the mat clinic while John started with detoxification in the wards at Madhari upon admission. This was before he could now be admitted at the rehabilitation center. I went for detox, whereby there was a certain injection for five days. Mm -hmm. Then after that, there were some medications to, to reduce the urge. Because at that time, I was very fresh. When I came here, I was very drunk. So yeah, there, it was a detox kind of a phase. On a regular day, on a, a regular normal day at the rehabilitation center, what, what is the day routine like for the clients that you have here? From when they wake up to the end of the day, what activities are they engaging in so that you know they they are rehabilitated or they are they, or you try to bring them back to society like every other normal person? On a typical day, they wake up at 6:30. Hygiene is key to maintain health, so they will take shower. Uh, some a bit of washing, cleaning, you know, I mean, doing, uh, doing just cleanliness in their rooms. Of course, that general cleaning will, will be done by, by uh, one of the paramedics that we have within. Eh? But the, the clients, as part of the rehab, they do their own cleanliness, and through that we are able to assess and know how how far this person has gone towards recovery. Because unkemptness is, a, is one of the signs that the person is still not yet okay. And after, after the, the routines, eh, what follows is they will take breakfast. Then between 8.30 and 9, we have something we call a room run. Again, the, the health worker on duty at this particular time We'll go to the rooms with some of the clients that have been assigned to supervise others, checking on how keen they were in doing the basics, you know, like bed making and that kind of a thing. Then after this, for those who are on medication, because as I, I, I said initially, we have people who develop complications from their substance use, but we also have those who have uh, some genetic predisposition to mental disorders. So the drug use was just like a trigger. And such people, as we do the rehab activities, they have to be maintained on, on uh, the drugs they are put on by, the medication rather, they've been put on by the doctor so that uh, we maintain the mental stability. So medication is part of what we have to do in our setup, unlike probably in those other rehabs. After that, we have a morning meeting. Morning meeting, again, is for everybody. All the health workers, the counselors, the nurses, the clients, we participate in the morning meeting. And in these morning meetings, we have quite a number of activities going on. It's not just an ordinary meeting. We have a, what we call a day's concept. And this day's concept is geared uh, towards, you know, the recovery. 
So after the morning meeting, we have a short break. They go for tea break. Then after tea break, we also have an activity. It could be spiritual care. It could be something to do with psychological care. Like there's something we call cognitive behavior therapy, which is part of how we manage these clients. So there's a day for that. There's a day for another model of uh, rehabilitation. We call the 12 steps. And uh, being that there are 12, quite a number, there's just a day that we set for maybe like step one, step two, like that. Yes. Then from there, it's lunch break. After lunch, then uh, again, on uh, routinely, afternoons are uh, basically either for occupational therapy done in the field or for counseling services. So these counseling services can either be one-on-one -on -one or a group, according to how the schedule from the Office of Counseling. The connection between a substance use and mental illness has been shown in various studies. These include anxiety disorders from generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorders, and post-traumatic stress disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, commonly known as ADHD, psychotic illness, borderline personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. People with schizophrenia tend to use alcohol and tobacco. People with a mental illness are also more likely to use prescription opioids, like we have seen when people buy codeine-based cough syrups, for example. And uh, who are the people that come to this rehabilitation center? Oh, the rehabilitation uh, services are meant for everybody, every mwananchi. Uh, but for some reasons, because of the cost, you find many a times the type of people we are managing are uh, civil servants, teachers. Uh, occasionally we get uh, students, most, mostly college students from the different universities that we are having within. And uh, those who are also still not working, are still, it, it is still open and they do come. We have health services here. I mean, we have uh, a center for those who are addicted and they do not know where to, to get these services from. And because this hospital being a, a hospital where we offer all kinds of services and refer what is uh, beyond us, uh, it is good for an INC just to get to know that uh, there are such services here because probably those within Nairobi are benefiting but people from far may not be aware that we have such services. How long does it take for one to go through the rehabilitation process successfully? What's the average time like? Yeah. Bearing in mind that every individual is different, but you know, you will have an average time that you can estimate that by this particular time that we expect to see some changes, or we expect to see that somebody is getting somewhere. In our setup, uh, the rehab takes uh, 90 days, eh? those are three months. And many times after detox, some of, of them are not still okay, so they will take like a month before you can see that sign of somebody stabilizing. So during the next two months, that is the time now you are seeing a direction on where somebody is heading. But all depends with an individual person. Others stabilize so quickly, immediately after the detox, they are just very alert, very organized, motivated to run the program. Yeah, but again, one thing uh, that it's good for the public to know is that an addiction, we say, is a brain disease that is chronic and relapsing in nature. So, you know, like many other medical conditions that are chronic and are likely to relapse from time to time. And so it is the case with, with the addiction that we are fighting. 
So you find, uh, depending on how long this person ha has used these drugs, how many times they have relapsed, the, the recovery period is determined by so many factors. Yes. I didn't have a lot of time, I didn't have a lot of time. I didn't have a lot of time, I didn't have a lot of time, I didn't have a lot of time. It is, it is always, to them, it is quite encouraging. They are, they are usually happy, you know. They are sharing with others to motivate them. It's about how initially they took it and eventually what, uh, what kind of help that was offered and the changes they are seeing in their clients. And so they really appreciate. <laughs> Right now about school because that's what is on everyone's mind. So I'll first put a break to it, but uh, I think of doing some shorter courses instead of maybe the longer term ones before I stabilize, because going back to the society, is, it's never just that easy. Yeah. People expect a kind of great thing from you, but yeah, it's, it's never that easy. Yeah. So at least MDM on your those people who come to the rehabilitation center unlike mental those acute mental disorders, they, they have uh, whatever. I mean, they are mentally stable, so they realize what kind of services they need. And because we have rules and regulations that before they are admitted, they have to read and okay or disagree with them. Uh, then many a times, by the time we are admitting them, the clients plus their relatives have read uh, the rules and regulations and they've understood, and so uh, the only challenges they are likely to get is maybe the amount they have to top up. Because they always keep on asking, they wish, uh, if it is uh, the issue of NHIF and the government assisting them, uh, they, they just wish NHIF was offsetting yeah, everything which again is beyond us. What is the cost of this rehabilitation process? In our rehab, currently the rates are 135,000 for the three months. So what normally happens is we, they are in categories. We have those who do not have NHIF. They would wish to pay up that money so like on admission, they would be required to pay a deposit of 30,000. Then as we go along, they keep topping up. Then we have uh, those who are uh, civil servants and the NHIF is uh, catering for all the financial needs fully through their cards. Then we have uh, the ordinary rates for 190 for, for NHIF those who contribute five, 500 per month. So what normally happens is, there is what we call cost sharing. So NHIF will cater for 60,000 for the, this three months period. Then uh, 75,000 has to come from their pockets. So on admission, they will be required to pay um, around 25,000 along with it activating the NHIF card, then they continue to reduce the, the amount as, a, as the client continues. Yeah, so that by the end of the 90 days, eh, everything is done. The cost of rehabilitating a person is not, is not, uh, is not two shillings or something like that. 
we've had scenarios where clients are like, had I not really gone into this drinking behavior, this amount of money that we are paying here, I would have by now bought a piece of land and settled. And so you can imagine if they are talking of something equivalent to buying a piece of land, then it's something that there are people outside there who are suffering simply because they, they really don't know where to get that money from. So ours is the cheapest. We talk of private rehabs. The cost is like three times the rate we have here. And so even if we still have those issues to do with finances, we normally advise those who cannot afford the inpatient rehab to try the CSAT, which I've talked about, and uh, the public seem not to be aware about, because their clients are meeting with their families. Family members are so much traumatized, they've even developed uh, medical conditions that are stress-related, and they do not know really how to go about it. And when they come here, as uh, we are opening the file for the client, if they also raise those issues, they are also seen and uh, they are managed and uh, through the support group that we are having there at the CSAT, then these clients, you find the, the families also benefit from that. So it's therapeutic generally to everybody, yes. Social support right from the family setup and not being judgmental is important for anyone with a substance addiction, particularly if the use of the drug is a result of a mental illness. Karonji's family at the time thought that he was a menace. That didn't make him feel any better. Well, it, it made me feel out of place, <laughs> you know, like I wasn't worthy. But as time went by, I, I, I grew out of it. Yeah. Do you think that uh, sort of accelerated or pushed you more into alcohol? Yeah, I believe, I believe it did. Yeah. Now, do you have any regrets? Well, regrets are there. However, we are, we are taught of ways to overcome. What, did you, what is it that you regret? Uh, of course, being kicked out of campus and uh, hurting them, you know, at times I could go and no one would know where I was. So yeah, I think they, they felt some, some hurt within them. Sayo, atu kwa tunawana na sana, na wawatarani sana, baka wandi wanakuja kunitafuta. Lakini saa hii, tunawana kila dakika, hata tunawangia na simu. Sasa tuko wazuri, hata wanafraya yaga sana. First bona kwa 25 years ni mkubwa, hata nafanya mambu yake. Lakini second bona kwa class 7. Nza tu mtoto kwa na witu ndogo. If you had one chance just to go back and redo everything, what would you do? Well, I would avoid the kind of company I kept and uh, try and, you know, I now understand what I'm suffering from, so it will be easier for me to cope yeah, with the environment that I'm in. Yeah. That's where we wrap up this show on drug abuse and its link to mental health conditions where patients with an underlying mental health illness use and abuse drugs in order to self-medicate and manage whatever mental illness that they are struggling with. I've been your host, Dr. Masi Korir.